Hey good people, Sammy Ash here, Executive Director of the Ash Academy, and your host of our Inspire, Uplift, Engage podcast. This is Season 2's finale. I thank you so much for tuning in each week and learning a little bit more about our guests through all these discussions on identity, culture, career, academics, and wherever else the conversation goes. Two quick reminders, please go get your tickets to our Mental and Physical Health Summit happening June 12th, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 12 p.m. Central, and 1 p.m. Eastern. Our moderators are a friend of the foundation, Donna Barrow, for our fitness and nutrition panel, and then our very own board VP, Camille Black, for our mental health awareness panel. Plus, you know we've got the kickback specialist back again with music, games and prizes last but not least don't forget to grab something from our store at theashacademy.org slash store now i usually tell you to get something for the family but i think you deserve to get something especially for yourself i won't tell anyone just do you all right let's get started with the show for one last time during season two Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Ash Academy's Inspire, Uplift, Engage podcast. We are here today with Francisco Cabrera Feo, a TV writer of Hintified on Netflix. Uh, you know, I will say just a little backstory. It was a struggle to get to this interview. <laughs> We are not going to hold any punches. My computer did not want to have this, but you know, we are resilient. <laughs> so thank you so much for sitting there waiting for me to get everything sorted out. Absolutely. No, I'm excited to be here. I like I like the name of the podcast. I'm ready to uplift. I'm ready to, 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 to tell, you know, hopefully we can get to have a good hour or so. Y- yes, we will. All right. So TV writer, let's talk about that journey. How did you get there? Like, what what is the the background, the backstory? <laughs> I'll say it's been it's been a wild kind of six months. You know, it's been that's that's how long the journey has been when it comes to TV writing. I've always wanted, you know, I've always been a, a writer and a director um, through since I was a kid. You know, I think I I wanted to be a mime and a guitarist and a magician. I mean, anything. Um, but hold up, I gotta okay, <laughs> mime. <laughs> I know. Can, can we get a little bit of a peek into the backstory on mine? Because that was a uh, career think, choice. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, I wanted to, be, I mean, I'm talking about when I was little, right? But um, I wanted to be a mime because my mother took me to see uh, this like famous mime. I guess there's famous mimes. There's this one mime, French mime called uh, Marcel Marceau. Um, okay. He, I mean, he has an incredible history of like, you know, during the holocaust how he like saved a bunch of kids using miming and he was just got kind of a hero uh and i saw him in venezuela when i used to live there um i think it was one of his last shows and i was super tiny we watched it in a concert hall um and i was like i want to do that um and i just basically try to mimic him um as much as i could and steal everything from him um but i think my mother for sure got tired of me and she's like sorry (laughs) <laughs> no miming, no magic, none of that. Because basically I would make them like stand, like mom, dad, like look at me, right? I think my whole life has always been like mom, dad, look at me. And it's always been like the thing, you know, throughout. But yeah, I mean, I was born in Venezuela and I lived there for 11 years. So literally half of my life in Venezuela, half of my life in the US, uh, which will mess with my identity soon. But right now <laughs> it's just um, half and half. But I grew up there, um, you know, I was born when Hugo Chavez uh, became president, which is kind of a, a big kind of a, a leader that not many of us agree with. Um, and, you know, we didn't have the best experience uh, us living there and it was a very dangerous country then. So, you know, my mother was a huge activist and she was kind of a fighter. and she would take us to protest, you know, I was nine years old and, you know, she was fighting for freedom of speech because there was this one channel uh, that the government was taking down 
uh, and it was the channel that we got our news from and they were, you know, kind of cutting the, the cord on that channel. And my mother spent months fighting on the streets to literally, uh, we would say libertad de expresión, which is freedom of speech. And she took us there, you know, I was nine years old and she would paint my hands white. And just to show that we weren't armed, you know, just to show the military that we weren't armed. So we, we had this nine year old with white hands up, up high. Um, so that's always been kind of where so much of like fighting to be heard came from was my mother literally put that, put that in us since we were seven years old or nine years old. So there's always been a story there and there's always been kind of like the, the pushing to be heard. And, you know, once I moved to the U S um, I realized that I was like, oh shit, like, wait, can I curse? Am I allowed to yes, curse? Oh, wonderful. Curses and then says, can I curse? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was like, damn, you got to cut it out. We're, good. Um, We're not going to bleep. You're good. <laughs> okay, great. You're great. And please stop me if I'm going too far on kind of oh, no, uh, please. in the backstory, but like, you know, moved to the U S and, you know, because I was this nine-year-old that had seen really terrible things and really kind of the trauma of growing up in Venezuela and like kidnappings and like shootings and all this stuff. Like I was, this, you know, 11 year old kid in the U S that was basically this like a little adult, <laughs> you know, I was this like, basically I, I was, uh, should have been a kid that like smoked cigarettes, you know, that type of kid, <laughs> because I was like, Oh, you little kids, you lo- you care about homecoming and prom and all this. Well, my family comes from the war, you know, <laughs> like that's oh the type gosh. of kid that I was, um, which is not fun to hang around with. Uh, <laughs> I see it in your face. You're like, yeah, it's like, can I, <laughs> should I even be smiling? About <laughs> this? <laughs> I know. Well, that's, I mean, you'll see a lot of my approach to these stories is, is that there's a drama version of the story, right? There's a drama version of my life, or I could find a way to make jokes about it um, and be able to laugh a little bit through this kind of pain. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, I was, I was a kid that didn't get to connect with the kids that were around them because I had been forced to grow up. So, and you know, you, you told me a little bit of passions with teachers and all this stuff. Like I only ate lunch with the teachers, middle school and high school. I only ate in the, in, in a teacher's classroom. I never set foot in the cafeteria. And that was such an incredible safe space that my teachers had given me. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of background of, there's a lot more, but, uh, but I just, the type of kid that I was based on like this little magician, little mime that then had to like see all this crazy stuff in Venezuela and then be the parent to my parents here in the U S. So how does that translate into the art specifically? Like, okay, you, you saw all these things you wanted to be them. And then now like it's happening or it has already happened for you. And we won't say your age. We don't want to say it like that, but relatively quickly for someone in, the, in their career trajectory. You, uh, you're able to. Absolutely. I think because I was constantly in rooms where I was the youngest person in the room, I think I always felt like I needed to catch up to them. Mm-hmm. So I always felt like I need to be like them, like these adults. You know, my mom, uh, she never let me sit at the kids' table. I was always eating with the adults. And I was supposed to hear these adult conversations and have an opinion on them, you know, really like they all kind of embrace me. And I think I've always felt like older folks have like taken me in and given me guidance. And I think when it comes to TV writing, you know, I had graduated college and in the middle of a pandemic. And uh, as, as you know, I graduated college in the middle of the pandemic. It's hard because my immigrant parents you know, did everything they could to bring their kids to the U S and then had to watch me graduate on an iPad. Like, come on. It's so depressing for them. Yeah. Um, but I went home and I realized, wait, like all I can do now is write, right. I can't really make films. I, you know, I had made films on my life, but I, right now we couldn't, it wasn't safe to, to do that. Mm-hmm. So all I could do is write. And all I could do is try to tell the story that I wanted to tell. And I had just finished college, so I wanted to continue telling a college story and how my experience was in college coming out and, you know, finding myself a little bit through there in a very southern town. So I wrote a script that I really loved and 
and I wrote it 26 different times. I mean, it was wild. I did so many rewrites. I have a friend of mine, uh, Carlos Cisco, that uh, that said, you got so many different drafts and so many different notes on the script that you were making a horse and you got a camel. Like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's, I'm going to use that one day, but also <laughs> you're right. A little hurtful. Okay. But but he was right. I had basically rewritten this script that was a story of my life in college. And I had taken everybody's notes because I wanted everybody to like it. And I realized, wait, 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 wait. Why do you want everybody to like you? You know, why do you want everybody to like the script? Everyone <laughs> who knew me in my workshop classes in film, and I'm also a Taurus, and it's Taurus season right now. Shout out. Um, I am not taking everybody's notes. Right. And they're going to be I mad did. at me. They're going to be mad at me about it. No, but like, I, I was like, okay, like I want to incorporate, but no, I don't want to incorporate yeah. everybody's notes. But I, I, I mean, I had to, I like, had to get okay, there. I would, I want to like, okay, I want to form it to make it, people like it, but like, yeah. But I lost myself, right? Mm. I lost why I wanted to tell the story. When you rewrite something 26 times and you let everybody tell you what type of story you're telling instead of you telling them the story you want to tell, you lose yourself because you're trying to convince people to like you. Uh, and I forgot what I liked about the script. And it wasn't until I had to send it to somebody that I really cared about, that I really wanted to like give me the shot, that I went back and read my first draft. So I went back, you know, 26 drafts back to my first draft. And I, and I asked myself, why did I love this story in the first place? So then I realized, oh my God, I've lost the thing that makes this special to me. Doesn't matter if it's messy. Doesn't matter if it's not perfect. It's me, mm -hmm. right? And that's what I'm selling. And that's what I want people to connect with. So I rewrote this 26 draft one more time, but this time I called it a gut pass. What is my gut telling me? What is the decisions that I have learned through 26 drafts that are going to get me where I want to go and they're going to tell the story that I want to tell. And that was the draft that like I sent to uh, the showrunner of the show that I wanted to work on. And just for notes, you know, not, I wasn't asking for a job, I wasn't anything. I was just like, Hey, his name is Marvin Lemus. And I was like, Marvin, like you've always like mentored me and shared a lot of feedback. And now here's a script that I've been working on. And I would love to just hear what you think. I know this is probably asking too much. So completely ignore this text message if you, you know, and he's like, no, send it away. What do you mean? Send it. <laughs> he's, he always says like, send, send, send that shit out. Like send it to me. <laughs> like he's very like, you know, I, I absolutely love him. And he sat with me and gave me notes, you know, and he was a showrunner of a TV show sitting with me and giving me notes and giving me feedback to tell the story that I wanted to tell, not the story he wanted to tell, but how to get me to tell that better story. And he realized, oh, wow, maybe you can write, you know? Oh, wow, maybe you are a writer. And, you know, that that was the first kind of like connecting with a TV writer as a writer, right? And I kept that relationship because it's somebody that I cared about. Somebody has always mentored me. So when I moved to LA for just three months, I, I was house sitting somebody's house. Somebody in the middle of, you know, like, obviously there was a huge like race, like awareness when it came to last year. So there was this white guy that was like, I want to give my house to like a POC writer, which, you know, I was like, okay, tokenize me, but also I'll take it. You're like, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be, I'll be your I'll token. Be <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, yeah, here's, there, here's my house in Silver Lake for free for three months. Come here and write. And I was like, okay, this so seems a little sketchy. I'm on out <laughs> right, right. <Silver> Lake. <laughs> so I show up there. And literally the first day I get there, I take a picture of me like eating a taco and Marvin texts me and says, you're in LA. Do you have a job? And I'm like, no. And he's like, he's an immigrant. So he's, been, you know, he's a, he's a children of immigrants. So this, he gets to say this joke, but he goes, oh, you immigrants moving, moving without jobs. And I was like, LMAO, LMAO. And he's like, do you want to work for me for two weeks? I need a personal assistant. So this is a showrunner who I was going to be his assistant just for two weeks. But I knew those two weeks were a trial run. I was like, mm -hmm. people say two weeks, but basically that means if you mess up after two weeks, they can be like, yeah, there's no more work. So 
I did 300%. I did everything that I could to be the best assistant that any, I mean, I did so many things that didn't even have to do with assisting just so that I could like show to him that I was a good storyteller. I was a good like person to be in the room with. You wanted to hang out with me. You wanted to hear me speak and you wanted to, to invest in me. Right. Like I was going to be a hard worker. It, it was so much that like, I, I never told him I didn't have a car. I've never actually said this. I've never told him. I have yet to tell him. Uh, I didn't have a car in LA because I was just there for three months, right? I hadn't even moved to LA. So I didn't have a car, but I didn't want to tell him because then that meant that I couldn't like ship things to like and deliver packages and letters and gifts. And that's very much a lot of the assistant work. Mm-hmm. So I didn't tell him. So then I used every you know check that I got as a personal assistant to rent a car for a couple of days so that I could deliver these packages. So I was never, I wasn't making any money. I was working, you know, I was living for free for three months because of somebody wanted to help a little Brown boy. Um, doesn't matter why they wanted to do it, but I, I take it. Um, and I proved myself and I, and I, and I did everything that I could. So by the time that was ending, he was like, Hey, this is this writer position, writer assistant position. So they needed an assistant for the writers in the writer's room for season two of Hentified. And he knew I was a fan and he knew that I loved the show and I knew the show. So I applied for that. And after a couple of days, like I got the job because I had proved myself, but I was, like I said, as a writer's assistant. So I came in not thinking anything else. And then through the, uh, through the application process, I realized, oh, it's not just a writer's assistant, but it's a script coordinator job. Yeah. And the thing about the script coordinator job is that it's a job that takes a lot of years to learn. And I did not have those years. I had months, right? Um, but I met with every script coordinator that I could. You know, I was like, I know this is my blind spot. I know if I don't get this job, it's because I'm not, a because I've never done this script coordinator before. I, I have to stop you right there. Yes. Because there's so many like things that are either intuition or divine timing. <laughs> Did you have any like teachers or mentors along the way that kind of got you in that mindset? Because that's a process to be like, okay, I know that I don't know what I don't know. Exactly. So somebody's going to have to help me out here and seeking that help. So like, how did you get there? Or was it like, okay, I'm, I'm going to need to figure this out myself. No, I think, yeah. I mean, I, I realized I've, I haven't stopped talking <laughs> in the last, you know, I was, I, I kind of pushed through it, but I, I think, yeah, I mean, part of it is the fighter spirit, right, of, of an immigrant family, right, and my parents who really fought for me and, and taught me that we have to work, you know, three times as hard, right, uh, so that's for sure there, but I think, you know, in high school, I had a teacher who was our TV teacher, a TV production teacher, who his name is Chuck Rivera, and he really, like, gave us a fire, which is you're not doing one, you know, a video project this week, you're doing seven and it's all due this week. And because it was about churning out work, it was about, Oh, this doesn't, this didn't work. Let's make another one. Oh, this didn't work. Let's make another. How do we make it better than the previous one? So he gave me kind of a fighting spirit. And then through college, I got to, you know, I got to make films that connected with people that I looked up to. Right. So I got very lucky my freshman year of college, kind of senior year of high school, where I was able to get a mentor that really, really believed in me before I did, right? Really kind of picked me up and said, there's something special about the stories you want to tell. You might not be ready just yet, but I believe in you. And that person uh, was Mark Duplass. Mark Duplass is an incredible producer and actor and writer who you know, he's in the morning show, but he's also like, he's the king of indie films. So he did like uh, the puffy chair and um, let's see, what's a movie called Blue Jay. And he has his show on, he had a show on HBO. He had two shows on HBO. Like he was like incredible. And he saw my film that I made in high school and he brought it to a huge festival and he like presented it and sold out a crowd and all this stuff. Because like I said, he saw something in me and he mentored me. and before, awesome. like I said, before I knew I had anything special to say, and I think all my life has always been 
you know, even talking about Marvin Lemus and Linda Yvette Chavez, who are the showrunners of Hentified, they saw that I was fighting to be heard. You know, my experience when I was in college, like in a predominantly white school where there was only two Latinx people and we're fighting to tell our stories and we're fighting to to even name our name our name our films in Spanish, you know, like that was a whole fight that we had to have. I had to fight about casting and how we needed to cast actors that were not just Latinx, but they had to be from the same country because their languages and their accents had to be different. So I spent so much of college trying to prove my existence that Marvin and Linda were like, whoa, this kid is going through it. He's never been in an environment where his identity is encouraged and it's loved and it's welcomed. So Marvin, you know, began to give me mentorship throughout, you know, gave me those feedback on the script. Then, you know, made me his personal assistant, then gave me a writer's assistant job. Then, you know, then I realized, oh, I have to be a script coordinator. And this is kind of going back to what we we're talking about. I and also please stop me. I will talk forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People are going to learn from this. So I'm not stopping <laughs> you until I need to ask the next question. <laughs> but so now I'm a writer assistant and script coordinator. Writer assistant, I could do. I know that I can take notes. I can organize them. I can keep, you know, the board the virtual board, because we did a writer's room online. So I know that I could keep the virtual board organized and I know that I knew the show. So if the writers just, you know, if, if the writers had a question about season one, I knew the answer, right? Even if like, even if Marvin and Linda had a question about season one, I was like, I know it. Even, you know, I, I know what happened and you can't say this because blah, blah, blah. But as a script coordinator, it's a job that you deliver the scripts and outlines and everything to the whole crew, the whole studio, the whole network. So you need to polish the script. You need to organize, make sure that all the locations are named the same. Make sure that, you know, through a rewrite, they change something in scene seven. So it makes a joke in scene 12 not work. And as a script coordinator, I need to track that. It says interior, but they're in a pool. So does that mean they're in an interior pool or they're in an exterior pool? I mean, there's so much stuff and I don't know how to explain it. Like it's a lot about continuity and it's a lot about how scripts change throughout the process of production. And it's stuff that I'd never learned and never learned in film school. So I knew that if I was going to apply for this job, this was going to be my biggest weakness. And instead of hiding the fact that I didn't know anything about it, I literally went in the meeting and I said, I know that you know that I've never done this job before. <laughs> And this is a job you give to somebody who's been in the industry for years. And I am not that person. But I've already met with Raul Martin, who was the script coordinator on Vida, which is a half hour show just like this one. He taught me how to do the job. And I know that if I mess up or if I don't know something, you'll never know, showrunners. I'm going to call him and he's going to give me the answer. So you never knew I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So, and they were, I think, impressed by that because they were like, even if he messes up, he knows where to call. He knows how to find the answer. And like I said, I didn't want to like, oh yeah, I can do it. No, I said, I've never done it before, but I have a team and I have a, a, a group of friends who will not let me fail. And I think that helped convince them for sure. That's got to be, that's definitely a, a triumphant spirit to just be like, okay, I'm going to be very transparent with you, but I'm going to succeed. So <laughs> I think that's the part of person that I am. <laughs> yeah. I think that's absolutely the type of person that I am is that like, you know, I, I've been trying to work on the show uh, this, this couple of weeks where it takes place in the eighties. And I'm like, I know that I wasn't born in the eighties, but Here's all the research that I've already done, you know, and this is me interviewing being like, I know that you're, you're going to look at me and say, what, how can this kid write about this? Right. And I, and I said that out loud to the producers and I was like, I know you're probably going to think that, mm -hmm. but here's the other expertise that I bring. And here's how I have already, even though I don't have the job research the eighties so that I can give you an answer and I can be culturally specific. So I think my flaws and what I'm, what I miss, I know, and I can be very self 
uh, aware of the things that I can't bring by from my experience because I'm starting out that I like attack those specifically. And I'm like, let me, you know, I call them blind spots. Let me fill this blind spot. Um, yeah, I'm not trying, <laughs> I don't know. I'm please. I, mean, I know that I'm no, like, you're I'm, already, uh, you know, I'm just going to call you pastor because you know, there's so many just like intuition based and self-awareness based things that people need to pick up on that you may not pick up for 10 years into your career. Like, okay, if I don't know something in an interview for a specific job, either I say, yes, I can do it and go Google it, or I can Google it on the job or like having the wherewithal to like, okay, I can do the research. So there's no reason to say, okay, I'm not capable of figuring it out at the end of the day. Um, so that's beautiful that you're, you're like, all right, like you, you already know I wasn't born in the eighties. <laughs> I did research here. Here you go. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's great that's great so what would you say is some of the best advice you've received along your way i had an experience where i had to go and pitch um or, or be at a pitch meeting where you know they were talking to this like big company it's like a, it was facebook they were they're were, they were pitching to facebook this show um and i was there and I was a little quiet, you know, I was a little bit, you know, self-conscious because I was the youngest person there and I didn't have the experience that everybody else did, but they're going around the room and everybody's introducing themselves and they're like, oh, my name is this. And this is all the work that I've done. Oh, my name is this. This is all the work that I've done. And they get to me and I go, oh, I'm Francisco. Yeah. I'm just starting out. I'm new here, but I'm excited to be here. And my boss at the time goes in front of the Facebook execs try again, do it again, introduce yourself again. Don't be shy. And I was like, wait, what do you mean? No, tell them, tell them. And I'm like, okay. So then I was like, well, I'm Francisco Cabrera. You know, I, I've, you know, I've made a bunch of films. We got a student Emmy. We showed at Outfest. We showed at this at HBO where, um, you know, all this stuff. And I told them the thing, you know, I was trying to be coy i was trying to be like no i'm just small and just don't notice me and instead i was like you know i've made these films this is where i've been you know the festivals that i've shown at this is the awards that we've won um and the facebook execs stood up and started clapping at me and i was like whoa and after he took me out and he was like don't ever do that again don't there's a thousand people who want to be on that seat and a thousand people who are on that seat that have not done the work that you've done. So let them know why you deserve to be there. And, and that was something that I still hold with me because yeah, I didn't, I didn't need to be shy. I didn't need to be small. It's not useful to be small. You're hired for a job and you're making, you're making yourself transparent, you know, so that you're nobody notices you. So nobody notices your hard work also. Um, so that was one of those times that really kind of shaped me. And the company is not Facebook. Facebook is the company we <laughs> we were pitching to. That's all. Hey, no worries. You don't have to say the company's name. That's why I let that go. People usually let it slip out. We, we and we got. I almost slipped it out, but I was like, "It's okay." Um, please, can you take that part out? Um, <laughs> you edit? Do you edit this stuff? If you need us to bleep, we will bleep. But hopefully you haven't said anything disparaging about anybody. So you're good. No. Okay. So on the flip side, what yes. would you say? So that, that was a great story. You probably had a good ugly cry. Probably at the, like after that word, like, okay, that, that's a reason to be like, okay, like, all right. I, I got some good notes. Yeah. Touching moment. But what is some advice that you're like, okay, I know that's trash. Like someone said something to you and you're like, mm, oh. that don't sit right with me. <laughs> that's a good thought. Um, I think, you know, we, we spoke about the 26 drafts, right? Mm. We spoke about the 26 drafts in the script. And I think there was a lot of notes that I did not believe in that I still took because I was a people pleaser. pleaser. Mm -hmm. I wanted to please people. And I wanted to say, yes, you're right. You're smart. I'm dumb. You're right. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead, I should have been like, wait, I disagree with this 
foolhardily and I'm still taking the note. What? So there's not a lot of specificness, but there's a lot of basically like, it's not a specific example. I know the specific example in my head, but I'm not going to tell it because it would be so, you know, <laughs> it would be like, oh, I know who said that. But I think I wanted to tell a type of story and the person that was reading the script and giving me notes didn't like that type of story. So then the notes that I was getting were completely swaying away from the, sh- the story that I wanted to tell. And at the time I listened and I said, you're right. And I took the note and I got lost. And like I said earlier, I made a camel <laughs> and then I came back and I was like, never mind. I do want to make a horse, not a camel. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's real though, especially in the arts where everything, I, I, you know, maybe on the tech side too, because there are teams and everyone has input, but still like there is like a, a whole bunch of eyes, a whole bunch of opinions that get placed on the art that you're like, okay, well, we, can we find a happy medium or should I not even search for that happy medium? Like, this is it. Like the edits need to be based on continuity and other things that are not beyond my storytelling or my style that's really that you're trying to change yeah uh, which is a, a reference to earlier when i'm saying really stubborn about that it's usually more of things you want me to change that have nothing to do with continuity it's it's like okay it, can you like water yourself down a little bit um no exactly. this is my style this is how i want to tell the story yeah um other notes will be listened to uh, i do uh, welcome yeah. feedback but it, it's it's usually not that situation when i'm saying no to it a hundred percent a hundred percent i think honestly on style like a lesson that i learned was you know reading scripts from you know i read the script for for vida on stars and i read the script for um, for my friend Dominic's script, a script called Papi. And I realized that their personality, their voice was not just in the dialogue, but it was also in the descriptions, which I myself didn't know I could do, right? I thought, no, the descriptions are very literal. You say exactly what's happening. This person walks here, right? Instead, you know, how uh, how Dominic or, or Tanya Saracho could, would write her, is that, you know, she would write, man, he wrote, you know, he, he, he ran to that door. Like there's no tomorrow. That's an example, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of him, like he, he walks out of the room, he goes, he blasts out of the room. Like, you know, like his mom is coming over and she's asking if the chicken is out of the fridge. Right. Like truthfully, like he would write things that had personality absolutely, that I didn't know that you could do. Yeah. And that touches everyone on set, not just yeah. the actors, everyone that's supporting everything that's going on. Okay, this is providing a certain feel. Um, yeah. So it's super important to not just be generic. And, right. The, just the, walking. The, <laughs> right. The generic thing is uh, he's scared because he forgot to take, you know, the, the, the chicken from the freezer. Instead, you know, Dominic would write, Oh you're shit, I forgot. A whole bunch of people with the, <laughs> what was that? Whole, you're going to trigger a whole bunch of people with the <laughs> forgot. Wait, to why? Because <laughs> somebody forgot to take the chicken out of the Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I've done that. My mom, you know, I see my mom parking and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I forgot. She sent me that text 45 minutes. <laughs> but I don't know. Like, oh, did I lose you? Are we, oh, I think you're back. Can you hear me? I think I lost you. Oh. Hello, hello. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. I think we're back. Okay. Awesome. I don't All know right. where we ended. So the, chi- the chicken is out of the freezer. <laughs> you saw her. She texts you. It's for- okay. Oh, I think I explained it. I think. Should I go from the top? No, you're good. You're good. Okay. So. <laughs> outside of the arts yes. uh, you you've uh, all these great things what brings you joy so like outside of things that you're creating like the, the simple things what what are those things that bring you joy yeah i um i got a wonderful experience uh to get to live with like people that i love so like my roommates and and just sitting out in in the couch and watching a movie 
I guess that's a little bit in the arts, but I will do anything. We don't even have to hang out. You know, we don't have to watch anything. We just sit in the couch and are bored to, in each other's space. And that's enough, right? That's really enjoyable. Um, and then let me think. I love eating. Oof, I'll go to, I, I'm like, I don't spend money on anything else but good food. I'm cheap on everything, but a Come good on meal. It. Come on past it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's an experience right that feels exactly. like art right it's Absolutely. the closest you know it feels like storytelling for me to have a good meal um so yeah i will you look at my bills and it's like you know i barely pay anything on like i never do anything big buys or anything crazy and then you just see like the uber eats <laughs> number and you're like oh god <laughs> what did you just spend money on wow, wow. food that's the answer all right uh I am a the or the resident foodie at the Ash Academy, so I completely understand. I, I awesome. you know, we see each other on that one. <laughs> uh, so I think this would be the perfect time to segue into our final line of questioning with our q a so who is your biggest inspiration hmm. i think for sure my mother is one of my biggest inspirations because she's such a fighter and i you know i mentioned why and she continues to be a fighter and she's also like you know she never said because i said so right you know when you know a kid is like but why do we have to go there I think most moms would say, because I said so, because I'm your mom. And my mother always sat down with me and explained why and had a conversation with me. And that like gave me some type of um, personal growth, I think, throughout throughout um, my childhood. Uh, so she was always so willing to listen and to speak. And she still is. Um, so she's somebody who constantly inspires me. I think you know, going into, you know, I'll, I'll forever thank, you know, Marvin Lemus and, and Linda Ive Chavez, because, you know, I, I spoke a little bit about how it's a script coordinator, right? Mm -hmm. But after two months of being a script coordinator, they, they told me, they, they, they gave me a script to write, right? And I became a writer. So in six months, I was from personal assistant to writer's assistant, to script coordinator, to a writer. And they knew that that would open doors. They knew that that meant that I would get, I would get into the union. I would be a WGA writer. That meant that, you know, I could be on IMDb, <laughs> you know, that meant, that meant that I could get a manager. Right. Mm -hmm. And they knew the power that they were, you know, the trust and power they were giving to me when I was just starting out. And the fact that they brought me up uh, and I hope to do that for other people. I hope to, I think that's what I'm the most excited about is to be able to hire all the folks that I know are extremely talented, but the, the world has ignored. Um, so I think I continue to learn from Marvin and Linda how to lead with, uh, with joy and laughter and not with fear, you know. Perfect. Um, kind of an easy segue for you. Who do you hope to uplift with your work? I, I, you know, I sat down with this, uh, with that idea because I wanted to, I was running my bio and I was like, what is, who are the folks that I want to, you know, uplift and who are the folks that I want to focus on? Obviously, like, there's no way I can tell a story without focusing on Latinx storytellers and, and Latinx people and Latinx communities, Venezuelan communities, brown and black Latinx communities. But I think more personally and more honest, it's like, the type of kid who will wear a t-shirt in the pool, you know, who was a little too self-conscious about themselves that I was, you know, that was scared that the kids would make fun of them for being themselves, you know, the, um, yeah. So the kids that would wear t-shirts in the pool or the, the, you know, the kids that would, you know, be too scared to be themselves and, 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 you know, the queer brown boys who, 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 didn't get to have the childhood they deserved. And a lot of the time when I'm writing, I'm rewriting my history. You know, I'm giving myself the happy ending I deserved. 
Um, and, and, and I hope to do that for, yeah, those kids or those teens or those adults that wanted to see themselves on screen and wanted to find joy in a lot of the trauma that they carry. Cause I think that's a lot for me. It's like, I'm going to give you the pain and the medicine. So you don't have to just suffer. Right. It's not just cause I, <laughs> I say this again, like I have a lot of trauma porn that I could give a lot of stuff. Right. But I want it. I want to be able to give you both. I want to be able to give you, yes, this hurts, but isn't it funny that it hurts this way and not that way, you know, uh, and finding the joke there because the laugh, you can't laugh without inhaling. And I think we need that in, you know, we need that. I need that. Fuck. I still need that. Um, yeah, that's all. I mean, you, you're just spitting all, all these gems. I, I appreciate it. I, I, you trying to get me to cry and you're not going to get me. You, <laughs> you ain't going to get me. But um, so uh, last but not least, how do you stay engaged with your motivation? In other words, what keeps you going? Yeah. You know, I think, you know, it's funny. I, I read that, you know, I know you sent me that, that question earlier mm-hmm. and I was sitting with my roommates and I was like, how am I going to answer this question? Because I'm not, you know, I think it's a lie to say that I'm constantly, constantly uh, at 100%, right? I think it's okay to honor the times that your body needs rest, that your body needs to replenish. You know, I spent six months working and moving up this ladder on, on the show, season two authentified then i was like oh i'm gonna take a break and then two days later i got a new a new job and i was like obviously i'm thankful and i'm happy and i'm privileged to have a job where did my pandemic. break go where is uh, my break <laughs> where is my break you know i'm like <laughs> i have a friend who always like you're never you know when are you gonna when are you gonna take a nap you know uh, even my bosses were like stop checking your emails during the weekend you know I think it's true and, and I need to, I need to replenish. So where do I find that joy to keep going? I think you need to recharge. I think I need to recharge. Um, so I'm not, I think it's, it would be dishonest to say that I'm always pushing. Sometimes I need to, you know, take a B, but when it's time to fight and time to tell the stories and time to get to work for me, it's, I don't know. It's hard. It's like, hmm. maybe we'll cut the silence, but as I think about it, um, <laughs> is there like always a supply? It's like, there's always something there for you to be able to fight. So you can push through. Is that, is that kind of where I think it's, you know, I think I still, I always have a story to tell. Mm-hmm. I feel like I have so many stories that that I want to tell that, you know, even in this hour or so talking, I'm like, oh no, I didn't get to talk about this thing. And that's okay. But I think for me is to tackle, it's to unpack a lot of the baggage that I carry. And it's important not to say that art is therapy because you still need therapy as an artist, (laughs) but to be able to rewrite and be the one who who empowers you in that story. You know, a lot of the times you're in the bathroom and you're like, you know, you're taking a shower and you're like, oh, I should have said this. Oh, I should have said that. You know, when you're thinking back at a fight or at a moment and you're like, man, if I only had this one line that I could have given him, that's what I get to do with my writing. You know, I get to grab the, the, the moments that scare me and my secrets and put them into a page and give myself agency, give myself power give myself um, confidence. So I think what, what, what pushes me <laughs> that I have found while trying to explain it is, is that I need it to survive, is that I feel like if I'm not doing it, then I'm just wallowing in that space of, of either depression or anxiety. And I think I empower myself to continue living through that writing. And I know that sounds super dramatic and super poetic or whatever, whatever corniness it sounds like, but it's true. It feels like, it feels like I'm giving myself agency when, for the times that I didn't always. 
So how, uh, how does it make you feel that you essentially through being a creator and an artist are going to help someone? Or have you reflected on, on that? That's a beautiful question. Um, I think it's a lot about responsibility, right? I think it's a lot about like, yeah, I need to be responsible about the stories that I'm telling because somebody might be connecting with this. When they do, and you know, I, I've I've written films and and I've sh- shot films and released films that were about my problems with how I feel about my body, and that aspect as a as a Latinx brown kid who is not comfortable with their body all the time, right? Or I've written stories about queerness when when I wasn't ready to talk about queerness, and I think people have reached out and shared how much it touched them. And it makes me look back and say, well, you know, those, all those sleepless nights, all those 16 hour days, all of that was worth it and, and was needed. And I think it was, it's enough, you know, it, I don't, it doesn't need to get a million views. He doesn't need to do whatever, you know, he doesn't get to need to get the likes. All he needs to affect this one person and that's enough. And the world's a little bit better, just a tiny bit better. Mm-hmm. you know and that's enough so it, it feels wonderful and when it does and i'm excited you know hopefully season two should come out this year and they'll be able to watch the episode that i wrote and that i co-wrote with other uh wonderful writers and be able to see like so much love and that we you know so much love that we put into this episode and hopefully touches other people as well I know I'm excited. Um, no more heavy questions. You're, you're almost in the clear. Um, so what's next for you other than Hintified season two for that, that beautiful episode that we're anticipating? Well, yeah, not only the, the season two of Hentified, but also uh, hopefully I get to write on another show. My dream is to, to continue to be a writer. Uh, and, you know, there's just shows that I love that feel like the change that Latinx stories need. So I'm excited to be a part of that new face of Latinx talent that will tell the stories we have yet to tell. So hopefully, you know, I should find out literally in like a couple of weeks if if I'll be a writer again. <laughs> um, if, you know, it's going to happen either way, it's, but we'll it's see. It's absolutely going to happen. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Pastor Francisco Cabrera <laughs> failed. Thank you for joining us. I, it, it was a joy all the way through. Uh, you are an old soul from one old soul to another i I see you i appreciate the work that you're doing keep going um once again thank you guys for joining us for the ash academy's inspired look engage podcast i am sammy take care take care y'all this has been a blast thank you so much